Hello, hello. Welcome and welcome back to the United Mates Football Podcast. Today, I am joined in LA by my old friend and regular contributor to the pod, Yoni, who's back in our hometown of London. And then as we typically do on the show, we have a special guest with us on the call, and they're joining us from Arlington, Virginia. She's the chapter chair of the Beltway Blues Supporters Club and the national chair of Chelsea in America, a coalition of Chelsea FC supporters groups across the United States. We welcome Alison Kasich to the United Mates Football Podcast. Alison, it is a pleasure to have you as our guest. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward to getting into a whole bunch of Chelsea chat. Yanni, always good to have you on the podcast. Not always great to chat about our beloved Arsenal, though. And so I think, as I referenced before, we're both weirdly looking forward to discussing all things Chelsea more than we typically would. There's a lot to talk about surrounding Chelsea at the moment. We'll get to that shortly. Otherwise, Yanni, how have you been doing? Yeah, I've been all right. Thanks, Kai. Thanks for having me on again. Um, as you say, kind of a relief to talk about a team that isn't ours um, and get some interesting insights into, at the moment, a much more successful team. But we'll, we'll come on to that a bit more later. Uh, as always, we like to start with an icebreaker. And as we're all dog owners, um, Kai, you have Zeus and Alison, you often post very cute pictures of your dog, Elway. I have a question about dogs and about footballers. If your dogs were footballers, who would they be? Who were their spirit footballers, if you will? Alison, while you have a moment to think about that, Kai, let's start with you. So that's a good question, Yanni. And Azusa, he's right by my side, so I should just ask him myself, but I'll answer on his behalf for today. He's he's a small guy. He's got quite a good leap. He's He's up on my bed typically most nights, and it's kind of higher off the ground than you'd expect a dog of his size to be able to get to. So it reminds me of a, a centre-back that we used to have at Arsenal, a Belgian called Thomas Vermalen, the Verminator, he was often referred to because he was quite a robust character. And Zeus as well, he'll bang into things occasionally. And it seems like he must have quite a thick skull, which I imagine Thomas Vermalen as well likewise did. So I'd say, yeah, Thomas Vermalen, Yanni, who does your family dog remind you of? Well, Peppy, who's a, a West Highland Terrier, full of energy all the time, like a little bit what's the word, hyperactive, I suppose you might say. And if you kind of kick a ball in his direction, he will chase after it and pounce on it, but not the best in possession. Um, so I would say a kind of Francis Coquelin, if we're going down the Arsenal route here, um, just someone who will, you know, very tenacious, snap into you, and then not really know what to do with it afterwards. Alison, what, what would you say Elway is? Uh, well, despite being named after an NFL quarterback, if I, uh, if I have to pick a, a, a footballer, I'll go with a, a former Chelsea player who I always loved, uh, Juan Mata. Um, you know, Elway is, she's teeny, she's adorable. Everyone loves her. I mean, who dislikes Juan Mata? He's just, you know, <laughs> seems like a great guy. And, you know, surprisingly fast and athletic for, you know, a, a smaller player. Yeah, no, very good. Sounds like all of our dogs have some decent talent on the on the football pitch. But moving on from canines to uh, Allison, your role for Chelsea in America. But I think before we even get to that, actually, let's take it all the way back to how you started supporting them in the first place. And I take it you're a lifelong sports fan from Colorado. And then I believe it was a semester abroad during college that was what brought you to West London in the first place. And that's where the Chelsea connection in particular originates from. But from there... Yeah. What was it about the club that stuck? Why was, you know, a replica shirt and the memories from your trip not enough? Why did supporting <laughs> Chelsea become a commitment and a passion of yours? No, for sure. Um, yeah, in general, huge sports fan, right? So, you know, when I was moving over to, to London temporarily uh, and lived pretty close to, to Stamford Bridge, just uh, down on King's Road, the, you know, I really wanted to, you know, see live sports while I was there, kind of immerse myself in, you know, the local culture, right? Um, and, you know, between football, rugby and cricket, you know, you know, I, I had played soccer as a kid, right? I just had the, it was the most accessible to me, right? So started paying attention and I just love the culture of it, frankly, right? I mean, uh, you know, we think we're big sports fans in America if you go to like, you know, an NFL game or an NHL game or something like that, right? But I mean, on match day, being near the state, I mean, everything was Chelsea. I mean, everything was Chelsea, right? It's like the world stopped and that's all that mattered. And I just, I love the passion of it and all that, right? So, I mean, it's hard not to get sucked into that, right? When you're in that local environment. And, uh, you know, it was 
difficult when I first moved back to, you know, small town college in Pennsylvania to, you know, you know, we're spoiled now with being able to watch all these games on TV and to have a vibrant supporters club community where I can go watch, you know, this afternoon, I'll go watch with my friends at the pub, right? You know, the, um, and it, uh, so it's, I think it's easier to maintain now, but it was certainly a lot harder when I moved back and, you know, trying to find internet streams just to get basic updates of what was, what was happening, but uh, stuck with it. And now it's, I mean, it's just blossomed in popularity, as I'm sure you can see, you know, in the LA area where it's just, you know, it's always been fun and it just gets more and more fun, you know, every year, the, the, the pub's more crowded the, and you kind of, we're building our own, uh, you know, not quite the same, obviously, but you know, our own community and our own kind of version of supporting, you know, from a distance. Yeah, it seems like every year there's a new team popping up in LA. We've got LAFC recently that kind of created the El, El Trafico fixture that took place, I believe, this past weekend. And then I think beginning maybe next campaign, Angel City FC, the women's team, um, that has a lot of quite impressive backers behind it, is going to be another team in, in LA. But touching on something that you mentioned uh, at your local supporters club that you're going to be around the pub watching the game at but bigger picture Chelsea in America how did you get involved in in that role and can you tell us just a little bit about what being the chair entails sure uh so with our local chapter in DC the Beltway Blues um I co-founded that gosh probably 12 years ago or thereabouts um you know because we wanted to engage locally and as I started immersing myself into that pretty quickly realized, you know, we're not the only ones, right? There's, you know, a great chapter, the LA Blues in Los Angeles, right? The um, you know, North Texas Blues in Dallas, right? There, there's groups all across the country. And I think pretty naturally, you know, started talking to them as just in like a peer capacity and uh, realized someone told me, hey, you should check out this Chelsea in America coalition. And, you know, once we heard of it, we joined very quickly, right? Uh, it's much easier to kind of, you know, network with other clubs and kind of share some infrastructure and whatnot to make our lives easier. Um, you know, if Chelsea come by for like a summer tour, as they often do when it's not a global pandemic, uh, it makes it easier for us to organize, you know, events surrounding the match and help make sure that we can get everyone tickets in the same section so we can all stand and cheer, you know, without, uh, you know, families yelling at us to sit down in front of them. Um, so joined the coalition and uh, a few years ago uh, was voted to take over as chairman, which um, I you know, was thrilled to be able to do. And yeah, we're here to support our members, right, which are the local chapters. So we have I think, just shy of 45 chapters around the country. You know, they're, some of them are big, some of them are small, but, you know, they, we all support the same club and want to help each other out. So it's, you know, shared infrastructure. Uh, it's really nice to know if I'm traveling for work back when that's the thing, <laughs> whenever that becomes a thing again, you know, if I'm in Atlanta, I can catch a match with the Georgia Blues. If I'm in Tennessee, I can, you know, catch a match with them, right? And we all know each other and have met on summer tours and things like that. So, you know, it's, it's really a coordinating function. We're here to help grow support for Chelsea around the country, right? Um, if someone's interested in starting a new supporters club in a new city, uh, We'll kind of try to help them as best we can so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's, that's kind of what we are in a nutshell. As Chelsea have been very successful over the last kind of 15, 18 years since Roman Abramovich took over there, how has support within the US grown? How, how have people become Chelsea fans? And how, how has Chelsea in America grown as, as a result? Have you, have you seen lots of, you know, petitions to join up with the with the fan groups have you seen interest also widen among various communities there specifically regarding Chelsea oh yeah it's been a huge growth um but relatively steady right um it's not as if it's a huge spike right I think each year it's just a little bit you know the local chapters are bigger the coalition is bigger a lot of that's due to the, the great work of the local supporters clubs right being out there and having strong local engagement and recruiting people some of it happens naturally, right? Like soccer's all over, you know, football's all over ESPN and NBC, right? It's really easy to watch and it's much more accessible now in a way that it didn't used to be. So that helps, right? Even if we didn't exist. Um, but I do think there's uh, something, yeah, like supporters clubs are not necessarily like intuitive to I think an American sports fan where like I'm a diehard Denver Broncos fan, right? I named my dog after John Elway, uh, even though she's a girl dog. Right? Um, that's how much I love John Elway. Um, I don't need to become, I don't need to be in a club to be a Broncos fan. And 
you know, go to games, watch, uh, watch at the bar or anything like that. So, um, the notion that like, no, we're really trying to build this community. We do charity work. We're trying to make it more than just go have a pint at the pub. Um, you know, that takes a little more explaining, but once in our experience, at least once people get connected to it and they see it and it's fun, you know, they want to be a part of it. Um, and they want to join. I mean, it it really sounds like, as you say, it's more than just a kind of fan group. There's there's a community there and, and things for people to actively participate in beyond just, you know, watching Chelsea and the shared passion together. I think something that's a theme in, in, in UK fandom and how we perceive other fan groups of, of the same clubs that we support around the world, and, and it might be a kind of patronizing thing as well, uh, but like when, when a player from another country joins that club, we almost assume, oh, there's, they're going to attract a larger fan base in the country of that player's origin. Can you speak to kind of the effects or lack of effect that Christian Pulisic's arrival at Chelsea has had? Has, has Chelsea become even more popular than it was or has that had no real effect on how people perceive the club in the USA? Yeah, I think it's helped. I mean, for, for someone like me who, you know, has liked Chelsea for a while and, you know, I also have a lot of U.S. national team scarfs in this mm-hmm. room. I mean, it's a dream come true, right, to have an American starting for my club team, like, couldn't get better, right? Um, but it certainly brought new people into the club. Uh, and hey, like, we'll take it, right? Um, I think it's really easy to get snooty about kind of like origin stories, right? Especially when, like, if you're coming from the UK, right, like, you probably support that club because your dad and your granddad and like, it's your local team, right? There's just a lot of geography and family built into that, that we don't necessarily have in the US. But I mean, just to give you a few, like a handful of just wildly different experiences that we have of uh, DC members, we have certainly picked up a few who, you know, they love the US national team, they love Pulisic, and they've just never really paid attention to um, the league. And now they follow Chelsea. And, you know, hey, I kind of don't care how you come in so long as like, you're passionate about it, like once you're here, and you're a good part, you know, a good steward of the community. But you know, we have another member, Lynn, her youth soccer coach in Ohio was a former Chelsea player from the sixties. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, you never know who has these random touch points or uh, had a friend take them to, you know, a a match or something, you know? So like, it's really all over the place. We have expats who just live in DC now for work, uh, who used to be season ticket holders at the bridge. Right. And uh, from my standpoint, they're all valuable, (laughs) you know, they're all, they're all supporters. They're all valuable members of our club. And, you know, no one's a, you know, a better fan just because they have a better origin story. Um, so long as you take it seriously, once you're going to, you know, once you're going to bother following it. No, absolutely. Of course, S- support can happen in, in many different ways. Um, and when it does, it's, you know, I, th- I think everyone's sort of all in. It's an emotional collection that can't, it, once you're in, you're in, you, it can't be reversed. And uh, I mean, speaking about investment, Chelsea over the last few years have been bankrolled by Roman Abramovich and in his time that he's appointed a lot of different managers many with different personalities but often big personalities um, and who in their own right are quite outspoken which brings us on to our first game of the show I'm going to put forward a few quotes and Alison and Kai will have to decide who said it a Chelsea manager or another figure from popular culture so it's time for blue is the color blank is the name Um, I hope you're ready for this. So I'll just say the quote and give you two options of a Chelsea manager or another personality from history. And you will have to tell me who you think said it. So we'll start off with who said this. The moral of the story is not to listen to those who tell you not to play the violin, but stick to the tambourine. Was that Jose Mourinho or Noam Chomsky? Alison, what's your first instinct there? I'm not quite sure it's dramatic enough to be a Mourinho quote, so I'm going to go with Chomsky. <laughs> okay, Kai? Yeah, I, as it kind of progressed through, the, through you reciting that quote, at first I thought it might be Mourinho, and then I was getting yeah, a bit less certain about that. So I'm going to double up on Chomsky. I'm afraid to tell you you're both wrong. That is a Jose Mourinho quote. Not the problem one is his... anything anything could be a Jose Mourinho quote. That's the problem. This, this, the man the man will say near anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, he he he's a, his are probably the more challenging ones here. We'll go we'll go for I think something that should be a bit more straightforward. 
it's better to be hanged for loyalty than be rewarded for betrayal. Is that Rafael Benitez or Vladimir Putin? I'll jump in with Putin. Yeah, seems a little too passionate for, for Rafa. Yeah, especially as someone who's managed Liverpool and Chelsea. <laughs> Talking about loyalty. Yeah, that's, that's a good point that I hadn't considered when choosing um, the, the manager that is Vladimir Putin. You've redeemed yourself um, on that one. Okay, let's take things to Italy. Uh, it's good to trust others, but not to do so is much better. Is that Antonio Conte or Benito Mussolini? Alison, what's your, what's your thoughts on that one? I'm, I'm going to go Conte. I hate to just, yeah, coffee Allison consistently, but I, I was thinking Conte as well. So for now, whilst the scores are even, I'm going to, yeah, stick with Conte. Maybe I'll throw a spanner in the works later on. <laughs> that is actually Benito Mussolini. Um, but again, Conte is one who just, you just don't know what, what he might have said at some point. Someone who's definitely, I think, made friends, but also probably quite a lot of enemies of, of players anyway within football. Okay, let's go on to this next one. I am in a lot of pain. They say it is more pain than when you have a baby, but I don't know as I have not had one. It is not possible. Is that Luis Felipe Scolari or Mike Pence? I'm going to go with Scolari. Yeah, off the bat. Okay, Alison? Yeah, I'm going to go Scolari. Again, you're both right on that one. I, I believe that was after the 7-1 defeat Brazil against Germany in the World Cup a few years ago. Clearly a very painful evening for him and his fellow Brazilians. Okay, if we do things properly, we have no reason to fear Barcelona. Carlo Ancelotti or General Franco? I'll go Franco. Just to make it exciting, I'll go with Ancelotti. Kai, you're right about this one. It's Ancelotti talking about uh, Barcelona FC rather than Barcelona, the <laughs> antagonistic state to his regime. Okay, just a couple more. In life, it is better to be foolishly optimistic than pessimistic and right. Avram Grant or Karl Marx? Um, let's go. It sounds quite philosophical. So let, yeah, let's go with Karl Marx. Yeah, I think I agree. It's Avram Grant, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, was, I was also surprised, you know, that that was something Avram Grant has said. But I suppose he's had quite a lot of failures in his career to be philosophical about so just to end up now uh, we're back with Mourinho uh, or Donald Trump he talking about God must really think I'm a great guy is both an answer that sounds like something <laughs> they would both say <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure they probably both have said that uh, I'll put my neck on the line and say that must have left Trump's mouth at some point yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna say Trump if I have to pick one, I'll pick Trump, but I would not put it past Jose to say that as well. It's Mourinho. I'll take your both answers, and that covers the basis of, uh, of Mourinho. He said that he was asked on the Spanish radio show um, what he thought God would, th would think about him. So maybe a bit unfair. He was put in a position where he specifically asked that question. But yeah, I mean, I'm not sure what the record is there. I'd say it's about 50-50, all things considered, for you guys, but... Yeah, Chelsea have had a lot of philosophers and politicians and people with very deep things to say managing their team over the last few years. Yeah, I think um, Mourinho and Trump in the same room would be, that would be quite something, but that's probably for another <laughs> podcast. So let's rather talk about more current kind of Chelsea affairs, what's going on at the club at the minute. And of course, you know, legendary ex-Chelsea player and at this point ex-manager these days, uh, Frank Lampard was sacked a few months ago. And then since then, Thomas Tuchel has come in. Chelsea's season has gone from disappointing to a place where, you know, now you're most likely going to finish in the top four. You're playing Leicester in the FA Cup final this weekend. And then if that's not enough, you've got the club's third Champions League final of the last couple of decades to look forward to as well. Uh, we're going to focus on those massive positives in a moment. But conversely, Alison, where, in your opinion, did it go wrong for Frank Lampard? You know, gosh, you know, it was all going well until it wasn't, right? You know, I mean, the last season, I think the team overperformed for the squad we had, right? He came in at a time when you can't imagine any big name managers would have wanted to, you know, manage Chelsea with the young squad, with the transfer ban, and, you know, came in third, right? I mean, like the 
kind of shocking how well um, it went. And yet going into this season, that momentum, you know, just didn't continue. Right. Um, and it, I think became pretty clear that whatever happened behind the scenes, the, you know, at some point, you know, you lose the locker room and then things spiral pretty quickly. And I mean, it was horrible to watch. Right. I mean, it's hard to choose between like, you know, JT or Frank for like, you know, kind of like all time personal favorite. I mean, they're both just such massive legends and, frankly, even though the season didn't go that well, I mean, you couldn't possibly put a dent in his status at the club. Right. I mean, like Frank Lampard is a legend full stop. Um, even if he got fired. Right. Um, but, uh, it's been encouraging to see things pick up again, obviously. I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed to be in a champions league final, but even to be in such a good spot in the league with the kind of, you know, roller coaster of a season that we've had. I mean, it's, a I think everyone's pretty happy with where we're at right now. I guess before Yoni gets on to Tuchel, uh, someone who has flour- continued to flourish under Tuchel, but really came to the fore prominently, I guess, originally under Lampard is, is Mason Mount, a player who plays a similar type of game to, to Lampard in some ways, a goal-scoring midfielder, kind of a box-to-box player as well. With the likes of Mount, and then kind of in the opposite direction, maybe more recently, the likes of Abraham and... Hudson Adoy in some senses as well. How do you feel Lampard set up Chelsea's youth as someone who wasn't originally a product of the academy? Obviously, he came from West Ham, but started at Chelsea from quite a young age. You'd think he might have an allegiance towards these these young English players, but it seems like he kind of drew lines in the sand under a few of them. And really, Mount was one of them he's pushed forward. Tamori would be another example of a player who he kind of sidelined. How do you think he, on a man management level, either did or didn't help himself during his tenure. Yeah. I mean, on the positive side, you've got to look at Mason, right? This is a young player who in very recent history was playing at a champ, you know, championship level. And I think now is pretty clearly, if not our player of the season, like a close number two, right? I mean, like he's really been a shining star and you got to give Lampard a lot of credit for that. Right. Um, in building up his confidence and giving him, giving him the playing time, right. For him to be probably our best player right now. Right. And, you know, last season, I would have said the same thing about a few players. Right. Um, I mean, uh, Tamori, you have the players that came up through the youth system, obviously. Um, but even, you know, someone like a, like a Billy Gilmore. Right. I mean, like, it was, you're like, wow, like it's been a long time since we had this many young players, right. Who are kind of, you know, homegrown, uh, that, you know, cause we've had a lot of flops, right. A lot of people that we kind of raise, you know, like the Josh McEachern's of the world that, you know, we think are going to be that next player and it just doesn't, um, doesn't pan out last season. I would have said, Oh my gosh, we have like five of them. That's a crazy spot to be in. And then pretty quickly, you know, for whatever reason, and you, you never know what's happening behind the scenes. So I try not to have too much, you know, too much judgment with it, but you're kind of sitting there wondering like, why isn't he starting? Like, why isn't he playing? Why we're sending him out on loan? Like, are, what, like what's happening here. Right. And uh, it's definitely led to this split, right. Where folks like Mount are thriving. And I mean, Tammy's sat on the bench <laughs> for a really long time, but I'll say, you know, Tuchel's putting him on the bench too. Right. You know, it's a, uh, I think now she's kind of created this, you know, inertia that, you know, some people are starting and thriving and some people haven't really seen the light of day and, you know, kind of makes you wonder a bit what's, what's happening. Cause they're certainly very, I mean, Hudson Adoy, tremendously talented Abraham, he's scored a lot of goals for us, right. You know, the, um, you know, he's doing his job as a striker and, you know, enjoying his time on the bench at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I mean, that was one of the, I suppose reservations people had beyond the disappointment that Chelsea sacked a you know club legends, arguably the best ever player in the club's history. Um, one of the reservations was what's going to happen to the light to, to the young players, and of course Mason Mount has thrived under Tuchel, um, and many thought Lampard saw a lot of himself in Mount, and that was one of the reasons why he was played. But if anything, he's gone up another level with Tuchel's coaching. What do you think Tuchel has changed? And why has it gone so right for him in the relatively short time that he's been there so far? Yeah, I mean, some of it probably is you're bound to get a bit of a bump 
just when you make a change at all, kind of regardless of who the new person is, because now kind of everyone is incentivized to this. I have a chance. There's a new guy in charge. I'm going to try to kind of prove myself. So, you know, I become his guy and not, um, you know, not someone else. Right. So I think you kind of get that natural kind of competitiveness, energy uplift of really the whole squad because they have a chance. Right. Uh, you know, uh, like, like the Marcus Alonso's of the world who hadn't played in a while. Right. Like Tuchel comes in now they're about, he's buying, is it going to be Joel? Well? Is it going to be Alonso? Could be either. Right. Um, so I think that kind of just naturally happens whenever, you know, we, we, we tend to make these changes a little more often than I would like, but, you know, it kind of happens each time, right. Regardless of who the new person is, but, you know, I think it took a, probably about a month, right. Like, cause you, like the lineups were all over the place when, when Tuchel came in and to some extent I get it right. He wants to test out different combinations and whatnot and see what he's working with. Um, but you kind of couldn't tell what, you know, his squad was really going to look like. Uh, but now I think it's really come, thankfully, <laughs> you know, it's really come together where, you know, you kind of understand like his style a little bit more. He's making more consistent choices and the folks that he's starting are, you know, they seem up for the challenge, right? Um, uh, you know, even folks that aren't, you know, everyone talks about how many goals burner, you know, hasn't scored, but I mean, to give him credit, he's had a lot of assists. He's making good runs, right? Like it's not for a lack of effort, right? Uh, he's clearly out there trying, he's clearly motivated to try um, and it's helping the team, even if he's not uh, kind of, you know, pushing things over the finish line. So uh, there just seems to be a bit of a, you know, an uplift in energy and it's, he's made good choices. So, I mean, the, the knock on wood, we can kind of, end up with some silverware at the end of the season, but it's certainly we're in a better spot, even if we don't. Yeah. I, I think you're right in the sense that you are in a better spot. Um, and regardless of what happens in the rest of this season, I think when fans are back, back in the stadiums, Chelsea fans will feel very positively towards Tuchel um, in a way that, you know, if they were in it, when he immediately took over from Lampard, maybe the feeling wouldn't have been so convinced as it would be now. Regardless of what happens in the cup finals this season, what are the expectations of Chelsea fans or what should you expect next season? What, what, what are you hopeful for um, in the next campaign? I hope we can be a little more intentional from a transfer standpoint of fitting needs, right? I mean, I think we've, and look at, we're not the only club by any stretch, but I think we've been uh, certainly guilty in the modern era of chasing shiny objects, right? And like wanting to bring in uh, attacking players, even if, you know, our, we really need defensive players or, um, or you know, things like that, right? Um, so making sure that we are being, I hope we'll be a little more targeted around bringing in players that are going to fit his system, Right. Because that's the trouble when you or that is one of the troubles when you have managers change as often as we do. Uh, you're trying to kind of make the best of what you have, even if, uh, you know, you wouldn't have picked those players from like a style standpoint. Right. Um, hopefully we at least have a little bit of confidence in the new guy to have his input <laughs> in some of the folks we bring in. And then okay, from a competitive standpoint, you've got to say if we can continue this momentum, I don't think we're there yet. Right. That you know, I'm not saying like, I would expect us to like win the league or anything next year, but like, I would expect us to be vying for like a second play, you know, the, to not hoping to make top four, but thinking, you know, Hey, we could really come in second here. Right. Like let's, um, let's have a strong showing and see what happens. Yeah. I couldn't really agree more. I think uh, the mixture of experience and youth kind of should in terms of the youth players only be going from strength to strength. You've seemingly got some ready-made replacements in certain areas of the pitch. The likes of Zuma coming through, Reese uh, Reese James, Chilwell was a good signing. You can, you know, the list goes on and on. Habits in theory is, you know, he started to step up recently, but is, you know, potentially a world class player in the making. Likewise, Pulisic. I am starting to go on and on, so I'll stop myself. But um, we have a little bit of one final game coming up. But before we uh, before we get to that, I just thought quickly, given that there's a couple of cup finals coming up. We might as well get your predictions, Alison, while we have you here. So as far as the FA Cup final against Leicester and the Champions League final, do you feel confident, yeah, giving us some predictions for those games? Oh, dear. This is gonna, I'm going to get myself in trouble. Um, I'm always nervous with, I mean, I'm nervous with any match, let alone a cup final, right? So I can't say I'm ever like, we're confident and going to win <laughs> it, right? Um, you know, I always have pretty low expectations. 
I was like, I'm obviously marginally more confident around the the FA Cup final, just given, you know, we're on good form right now. It's coming up more quickly. Um, and City is just so unpredictable, right? Like which city is going to show up on the 29th, right? At times they have looked absolutely unbeatable this season uh, in a way, you know, similar to like how Liverpool was last season in certain, you know, for certain stretches. And you think, gosh, we're just going to get destroyed, <laughs> you know? And then, and yet we knocked them out of the FA Cup and, you know, we come back and win. I mean, it was a pretty cagey match on Saturday, but you know what I mean? Like we've beaten them in situations when no one expected us to beat them. And yeah, I don't want to be overconfident and say, yeah, we're going to beat them three times in a row because that would be difficult to do with any team, let alone, you know, the league champions. So I think that'll, you know, but cup finals, you know, not going to hopefully, you know, it'll be close either way. Mm, well, I think you guys are in with a good shout. Yanni, for what it's worth, how do you feel about those upcoming games? I expect Chelsea to beat Leicester on Saturday. Um, just the way Chelsea are playing on top of the fact that they just have, in my view, a, a stronger squad. Um, I think I think they'll do it. It might, it might be a tight game. Um, City, again, I think City are favourites and they've justified that tag as favourites over this year. So if I had to, you know, put something on it, I'd say City. But yeah, like Tuchel has obviously showed himself to be very astute, very astute in games against Guardiola. And also there's just something that feels very narrative driven about PSG sacking a manager who immediately goes and wins the Champions League with another team. Um, so that's in the back of my mind. I would still say this is your favorites though. But you're right. I, I mean, it could end up being a very successful season for Chelsea and Chelsea being in two cup finals at all is indicative of the success that they've enjoyed over the last 18 years. Um, but that's not to say that there haven't been a few missteps along the way. Um, so to finish up, we're going to play another little game where Kai and I will be helping Alisson to build a flop Chelsea 11, uh, mostly from the Abramovich era. And we'll do this by going through each position and taking it in turns um, and asking which players form the team that best kind of encapsulates the signings that didn't really work out for Chelsea. So I'm just going to throw names at you here and you're going to tell me who feels right. Um, and I'll start in goal. Uh, here we have Kepa, uh, Marco Ambrosio, Rob Green, Mark Schwarzer, Asmir Begovic, Ross Turnbull, Hilario, uh, Mark Bosnich, Eduardo, Neil Sullivan, and finally John Terry for those 10 minutes or so he was in goal against Reading all those years ago. Uh, Addison, do any of those names jump out at you? He is certainly, he is far from the worst goalkeeper on that list. But if you think about flops from a, or disappointments, I should say, from a signing standpoint, like the fact that Kepa, when we brought him in, was the most expensive, you know, keeper transferred ever to mm -hmm. now not even being the starter pretty quickly after that. Um, at least relative to how much we paid for him, right? You'd say that didn't turn out uh, as well as it could have. Um, though, obviously, I mean, he did decent when he was the starter. Yeah, I mean, Kep has proven to be a huge investment that hasn't gone to plan, obviously. Kai, are there any arguments there from you? No, not really. Kep is unfortunate in that he's a victim of just the nature of the transfer window in some senses. I believe it was the same window what the Allison went for a lot of money and then likewise Courtois, you know, it was the quick turnaround of, Courtois and then Chelsea were left last minute needing to sign a keeper. And so they massively overpaid for Kepa in the first place. Not really anyone's fault. Um, and certainly, yeah, not really Kepa's fault. But given, as Alison mentioned, he's the most expensive goalkeeper in the history of the game. It's, it's got to be Kepa. Um, but we'll move on to the defence from there. And right back, we've got a few names to choose from. Uh, none of them, yeah, commanded astronomic fees like Kepa, but nonetheless, the names are Khalid Boularouz, uh, Bosingwa, Glenn Johnson, uh, Zappa Costa, and then a lesser known player in Wallace, who was signed from Brazil with quite a big reputation and not sure that he ever went on to make an appearance for the club. So Alison, if there's a name I've missed, feel free to throw that into the mix, but are any of those players standing out as a flock at right back? Well, I can't pick Basingua because he at least gave us a memorable unibrow to look at during matches, <laughs> you know, so special place in my heart for that. Um, 
probably uh, blurs. I mean, none of them, none of the rest of those folks, do you really look back and say, oh yeah, like what a, you know, what a star, right? Like, I think you can make a good case for, um, for any of them, but um, maybe a player like, you know, Glenn Johnson who had success elsewhere, right. You know, and this kind of, you know, sometimes it's not a great fit for, you know, a, a club at a moment in time. Right. But, you know, still a good player, right. Just not really a Chelsea, you know, legend in the Chelsea sense. <laughs> Sounds like Khalid Boularouz maybe is, is your choice. Yoni is the man who was pretty good at kicking other players uh, going to make your spot at right back. I think so, yeah. It was in that era of Chelsea where they would buy players and if it didn't work out, they were kind of gone after a year and Boularouz was another kind of one-year wonder or not as it turned out. And I just have the only memory I really have of him is him getting set, sent off at the Emirates, I think, for a last man tackle on Adebayor or something. Yeah, just didn't work out. And a player who I think Chelsea expected more from. And also, also, worst of all, was a right back who wore the number nine, which just can't be forgiven on any level. Um, we move on to centre back. And this was Kai and I had trouble picking names for this because I think Chelsea have by and large recruited very well in this position. So a lot of these players are players who also just didn't fill their potential at Chelsea, um, despite quite a lot of hype. But here we have Tal Ben Haim. Winston Bogards, Michael Mancien, Jeffrey Brumer, Nathan Ake, Kalash Miazga, Fikayo Tomori, and Slobodan Rajkovic. Um, so two from here, Alison, if you would. Well, I'd say as an American, I've got to throw Matt Miazga in there. Technically the first American we signed before Pulisic, <laughs> who at the time was like up and come around the US. He's also kind of bottomed out on the national team as well. But it was like, oh my gosh, like, Chelsea just signed an up and coming young uh, American center back and we got very excited and he played like one preseason game and then got shipped off to somewhere in Austria on loan. And, you know, that was kind of the last you heard of him. So definitely him. Uh, and I think I'll go Tal Ben Haim. Yeah. Uh, another kind of weird Latin Mourinho signing in, in his first spell, wasn't he? And another one who only stayed a year. Um, Kai, any, any other names there or would you go with that partnership? I would be for sure happy to throw both of those names, Ben Haim and, and Miazga. And yeah, with Miazga, a lot of hype, especially as you mentioned, Allison being the, the actual first, first American to join the club. But Ben Haim, likewise, one of those players who clearly was just built for a Sam Allardyce team. And you can't get too much further from Allardyce when it comes to, to Chelsea, especially at the time that, that Ben Haim joined. Otherwise, purely for the financial windfall that Chelsea missed out on, and given that he's just become a Premier League champion with Manchester City, Nathan Ake looks like an opportunity lost. Uh, a left-footed centre-back who you always kind of, from an aesthetic point of view, feel like you, you want to pair a left-footed player at the back with a right-footed player. And Chelsea certainly have plenty of talented right-footed centre-backs. So you could see Ake at the very least being a handy squad player for them at this point in time. Um, but I'll, I think I'll defer to, to Alisson's picks. And I think Ben Haim and Miazga are the ones who are going to win out um, moving on to left back, where I think definitively there have been a few more flops. So beginning the list is Felipe Luis, who came from Madrid and quickly went back to Madrid. Uh, we've got Baba Raman, quite a mysterious case of Baba Raman in the earlier days, Asier Del Horno, uh, more recently Emerson. And then again, in terms of maybe just not fulfilling the potential that he had at the club, uh, Patrick Van Arnholt. So Allison, who's going to be the flop left back? I think I got to go Felipe. Despite the hair, the flowing hair, I got to go Felipe Luis. I feel I remember more about the headbands he wore than about anything he did on the pitch, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Yanni, who actually yourself, I believe, when you play football are not, not opposed to a headband. Uh, but uh, <laughs> is, uh, is Luis going to be the left back or do you have another name that you feel earns that spot? Um, I mean, I'll defer to Alison's judgment because she, she knows Chelsea a lot better. But Felipe Luis, I think it seems like he was just kind of unfortunate in timing and stuff because he has otherwise been like an excellent world class left back and just came to Chelsea at a time where they played four at the back. And as Piliqueta had nailed down that position as the kind of inverted left back, and he just didn't get a look in. I'm not sure it's because he was like a particularly bad player at Chelsea or if he just didn't get the chances, but 
he just wasn't going to get in front of um, Aspi. Uh, I would have maybe gone for Asiel Del Horno, who I just remember as being on like one of those at the early Brownridge stage, Chelsea's rotation of left backs, him and Wayne Bridge, before finally they kind of got Ashley Cole, who would be their defining left back. And so Del Horno just in the kind of early era, Chelsea spending on these, you know, big names from the continent and then disappointing. But Felipe Luiz, in terms of, you know, his quality and not really showing it at Chelsea, probably has the biggest discrepancy there. Right midfield, there are a lot of good names here. So I'll go through them now. You've got Quaresma, Sean Wright Phillips, Mo Salah, Bertrand Traore, Juan Cuadrado and Go Cantore, who, who I believe if he didn't start at Chelsea, was that was his first English club. Um, so apart from him, all players who <laughs> like showed glimpses at least of sort of potentially world-class quality throughout their career. Um, Alison, do any names stand out to you from that list there? In terms of quality of player, the yeah, probably Cuadrado stands out as just kind of not really being as good as we you know hoped he would be from a sure missed opportunity standpoint i mean you kind of would have to pick someone like a like a mosala right i mean just look at how amazing <laughs> he's been for liverpool and you just kind of kick yourself like like could we have had you know like you just second guess right like could we have had that had we played him more and you know and again the maybe yes maybe no right maybe just that environment is better for him you never know with these things but he certainly uh is one of the many like you know similar to de bruyne De Bruyne, right? You were just like, oh yeah, I kind of wish we didn't, <laughs> wish we didn't <laughs> let go of you because you're a um, this kid's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, between Salah and De Bruyne, you've got you know two players who are consistently in the best 11s people put together for team of the season. Kind of every year they've been in the Premier League. Um, Kai, what about you? Any, any names there that you think should be in this team? I think similarly to Cuadrado. Sean Wright Phillips came in with a massive kind of expectation and in theory he was only going to get closer and closer to the perceived ceiling that he had um, at that time and from an you know England football perspective as well it's it's a shame that that didn't work out otherwise yeah Cuadrado so exciting at international tournaments for Colombia and has you know salvaged a solid career at uh, Juventus since since Chelsea Um, but I think I would have to weigh in, yeah, with Mohamed Salah, just in terms of an opportunity missed, someone who has arguably been the best player in the Premier League over the past, you know, maybe not this year as much, but he's still chipped in with a lot of goals for an otherwise disappointing Liverpool side. So, you know, three seasons or so, this guy's been magnificent. And just another one who suffered from maybe not being a big enough name at the time and not getting a look in at Chelsea. So I, I would have to say... Salah but Allison between it sounds like Salah and Quadrado do you have a strong opinion for one I'd go Quadrado just since unfortunately didn't really contribute a ton to the club and at least you know Salah went on to contribute to suffer somewhere it just wasn't uh, it wasn't for Chelsea <laughs> Quadrado's the guy so he's gonna make it in right midfield moving on to the center midfielders and there's a fair few we'll pick two we've got the likes of Manish uh Minero who was a I can't really remember the circumstances surrounding his signing, but hardly played a game for the club. Scott Parker, another kind of guy who fulfilled his potential elsewhere. Steve Sidwell might even have come at the same time as Tal Ben Haim in a very budget transfer window, relatively speaking, for Chelsea. Um, Danny Drinkwater, a Premier League champion with Leicester. Deco, who came from Barcelona uh, under Scolari, I believe, and kind of set things alight at first, but then I think quite quickly found the Premier League to be a pace that you couldn't keep up with. We've got Tiamue Bakayoko, very expensive signing who didn't really you know, do it at Chelsea. Alexi Smirton, who I think there was a lot of talk around him being signed a lot on the virtue of the fact that he was just a Russian footballer and that was kind of an Abramovich direct signing, people used to say at the time. Ross Barkley, uh, Marco Van Ginkel, Kevin De Bruyne, that name has popped up again. And then Juan Sebastian Veron, who arguably likewise didn't do it at Chelsea or Manchester United. Uh, So Alison, two from those midfielders. That is a lot of good ones to choose from. Um, You know, I'll, I'll definitely go with Bakayoko as one of them because, you know, look, some of those players came in with, I think, relatively low expectations and then met, met the low expectations. Right. But it wasn't as if like the floor got, 
cool. You know, I don't think anyone thought like Steve Sidwell was going to be like the savior of our midfield. No offense. Right. Um, squad, you know, this is squad. He's like, we added a squad player, uh, which, you know, you need to, but I feel like, like Bakioko came in with so much hype and I was like, who's this guy? And I was like, he's going to be great. And then that did not, that did not happen. That fell pretty quickly. And then, and then he was gone. And then, gosh, you know, drink water in the sense of, you know, after Leicester won the league and the, gosh, what a crazy season that was. Right. Um, you know, everyone other than Vardy started jumping ship and going to other teams. And some of those were, I mean, like Conte easily one of the best signings we've made in a very long time. Right. Um, just from a quality standpoint and, uh, Drinkwater, who was like not the key piece of that Leicester team, but I mean, an important piece. Just, you know, it was, I don't know if it, it, it almost felt like he had won and it was just like, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go relax in London and, you know, make a lot of money sitting on the bench at Chelsea and kind of seemed okay with it. Like, as far, you know, like, you know, never seemed that upset like the other people on the bench. So maybe not disappointing to him, but, you know, disappointing to to us who thought we at least were getting a good kind of squad contributor in the midfield. Yeah, those are two good shouts on back of Yoko. Like, he pretty much summed it up better than I can. And then with Drinkwater, I think he's in Turkey at the minute on loan, was a player who came through, I'd want to say, Manchester United's academy with a good amount of potential, didn't make it there, and then was obviously part of that fantastic Premier League winning Leicester side. Funnily enough, at the mention of drink water, when you you started talking about it, my dog decided to go and drink some water, and I don't know if that picked up on the audio. Um, But nonetheless, Yanni, um, how do you feel about the centre midfield spots? Yeah, I think Bakayoko is the first name on my list too. Uh, And when it comes to like disappointments, a lot of it is defined by who do these players come in to nominally replace. And Bakayoko was coming in to replace Nemanja Matic, who was Chelsea's Nemanja Matic, not the Matic we've seen at United. Um, big shoes to fill, and he'd like never, ever looked like coming close, really. Um, so he's in for me. And then the second one, I mean, drink water, yeah, there's a good case there. For variety, um, I'll, I'll say Ross Barkley, just because... Like when he was at Everton, he was an exciting prospect. It almost felt like he took too long to leave. And when he did leave, it just never felt like Chelsea was really the right place for him. It never felt like a a kind of good fit for the club or the player. And again, it's kind of a a series of false starts for him. He, He went to Villa this season, started off very well. And now it's like they've almost moved past him. Um, He's not really sure what he is there. And it's just a case of a career, in my opinion, flagging a bit. But I'm happy to go with Bakayoko and Drinkwater um, just because Drinkwater also kind of felt like a hanger on after the Leicester City title win. And he made a lot of sense in that team. Um, but unlike Mares or Kante, where their quality is self-evident, it never felt like Drinkwater's abilities would necessarily translate to a better team. You know, another kind of ex-Chelsea player, um, well, con- you know, on the flip side uh, in that Leicester title winning side, Robert Huth, who, no disrespect to the guy, but arguably, a lot, along with a bunch of other players in that Leicester side, you wouldn't consider typically to be Premier League winners. They obviously, again, going back to Ben Haim, a player who can play in an Allardyce team, Drinkwater was a player who could play in that Ranieri, another Chelsea link. He could play a specific role in that side, but put him in, you know, a team trying to play possibly more expansive, more dynamic football like Chelsea, it, it didn't work out. So I think he's got to sit alongside Bakayoko. But Yanni, let's hear about those left wingers. Yeah, so here we have another kind of eclectic group. Uh, Yuri Zhekov, Gel Kakuta, Kennedy, Christian Atsu, Lucas Piazon, Thorgan Hazard, Yossi Benayoun, Marco Marin, and Fabio Barini. Alison, of those names, are there any that stick out to you? <sighs> several the you gotta get i mean kennedy his neck tattoos were the most memorable thing of his <laughs> you know tenure at chelsea right um uh and the, you know controversial <laughs> social media posts um the so that certainly didn't work out some of the like with with the with with eden's younger brother yeah it was easy to get excited about that because of the last name but i also don't think anyone thought like oh, this is going to be like, we're going to have two hazards. You know what I mean? Like, the, I don't think the expectations were really that high to consider it like a failure. Um, maybe Marco Marin. I mean, the 
he was kind of in that time when we were signing like a lot of these kind of these, like smaller, like attacking players and everyone was talking about, Oh, this is, you know, it's like the, I remember someone called him the German Messi, and I was like, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, the, can barely get a game. I was like, oh, the German Messi is not very good um, <laughs> compared to the rest of the squad. So, yeah, I don't know if he just got overhyped to me or in general, but I was like, mm, this guy just seems kind of okay. Yeah, um, he was yeah part of that collection around the time that Oscar joins and Andre Schurler joins, um, Hazard not far behind. Um, Kai, how about you? Any names on the left wing that stick out? On Kakuta, I think what's you know interesting beyond the hype that he came in with as possibly a 15 or a 16 year old. He was very very young when he joined the club, um, but the fact that there was so much controversy surrounding that transfer that Chelsea, who years later did get a transfer ban, I think were being threatened with at the very least a transfer ban at the time. And I don't know if they did end up having to pay a fine. Can't remember the circumstances around it kind of again at a similar time to the John Obi Mikel thing where everyone thought he'd signed for Manchester United. Or so, you know, there was, a, there was a few kind of dodgy dealings that might have happened in that period. But I would go with Marin as well, who beyond being another shorter player, that was about as much as he probably did have in, in common with, with Messi. Although at Bremen, he was a pretty good player, but the Chelsea move really didn't do any favours to his career um, in terms of going from strength to strength or from an international scene perspective. I don't think he got many caps, if any, for Germany after that. Um, so I think Marin's got to be the, the left winger. And then we'll pick a couple of strikers. Um, a bunch of great names here. Yeah, some of them didn't necessarily do it at Chelsea, or I should say all of them at, at a certain level didn't. So we'll start with Andrei Shevchenko, the legendary Andrei Shevchenko, Fernando Torres, Michi Batshuayi, Alexander Pato, Radamel Falcao, Gonzalo Higuain, who's stateside these days, uh, Alvaro Morata, Mattia Kesman, uh, the naughty boy Mutu, uh, Claudio Pizarro, Franco Di Santo, uh, Ben Sahar, Loic Remy, Dominic Solanke, and then just because he's doing quite well and I don't think ever made a senior appearance for the club, uh, Patrick Bamford. Allison, do you want to pick two strikers? Okay, yeah, you could make a whole team just out of, <laughs> out of failed strikers. The, I will say, if I was being more objective, I'd be tempted to pick Torres just because, you know, he had experience in the league. I mean, killed it at Liverpool, right? And you would think that, you know, he had a proven ability to do well in the league and it didn't work out that well at Chelsea. However, he did score that goal against Barcelona in the Champions League semifinals, and that made every penny we paid for his transfer fee well worth it as far as I'm concerned. So I can't pick him. Um, I think I'll go with uh, Shevchenko for one of them, simply from a, I mean, gosh, think of how good he was at the the World Cup before we, uh, you know, leading up to that signing, right? Like he was probably the most buzzed about play you know, when we signed him, it was just like everyone was after him, right? The And it just never quite worked out at that level. Um, and then, you know, it's not often that you get, you know, strikers with, uh, you know, drug controversies while they're playing. So I think I got to go with Mutu just for, <laughs> just on that margin, you know, at least, at least the rest of them to our knowledge, you know, stayed out, stayed off the cocaine. So. <laughs> yeah, I think Mutu picked up where Mark Bosnich left off back in the day um otherwise yanni can you kind of confirm those two names or how about maybe matthias kesman who i believe at this point supposedly is is a monk if that if that really is true. yeah I, there's some stories that have done the rounds um he also looks quite different to how he did um back then one way or another but yeah yanni how who are, who are your strikers um i like shevchenko as well was the first uh, in my mind, um, just as Alison said, like, he was so good before, like one of the hottest strikers in Europe and just completely flopped. Um, and I would be tempted to go him and Torres. And like, obviously Torres has his moment, his defining moment in a Chelsea shirt. But in terms of the outlay and the expectation, again, as, a, as an Arsenal fan at the time, I was thinking, like they've got Drogba now, they've got Torres. Like they've just got so much firepower, um, and it just didn't work out at all. Um, maybe in retrospect, he was already slightly on the physical decline after a couple of serious injuries at Liverpool. Um, but at the time, it felt like okay, Chelsea just have the best strike partnership potentially in the world here, and it 
like failed spectacularly that I like I barely remember them even playing together Drogba and Torres so that would be my pick but maybe Mewtwo does deserve to get in on in the like just because he has a felony <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you kind of put that much money up for a player who then goes on to essentially you know throw it throw it out and back in your face it's it's not good I think for the reasons that Allison mentioned as far as the memorable moment the contribution to the Champions League which you know may be the first of two depending on how you know the game against City goes um, and as well as that from a neutral perspective the epic commentary provided by Gary Neville for that moment at the new Camp uh, I think I think Torres can't be in this team so it's going to be Mutu alongside Shevchenko which means that the starting 11 of flops is Kepa in goal, a back four of Khalid Boularouz, Tal Ben Haim, Matt Miazga, and Felipe Luis. On the right of midfield, we've got Quadrado. Centre midfield pairing of Danny Drinkwater and Tiamoe Bakayoko. Marco Marin on the left. And then up top, the legendary Andrei Shevchenko and Adrian Mutu, legendary for the other <laughs> side of the spectrum reasons. Uh, decent side on form, but not at Chelsea necessarily. But I reckon that's about as much as we have time for today so i want to say thank you to yanni and then a very special thank you from both of us to alison Kasich. it's been a pleasure to have you on the podcast alison we hope you've enjoyed yourself and what's the best way for people to follow you and how can they follow chelsea in america and maybe even get involved themselves if they're living stateside yeah no my pleasure to be here this was a lot of fun uh chelsea in america.com uh, has a pretty much all the information people would need to find a supporters club uh, in kind of your neck of the woods. Uh, we have chapters all over the country. And then uh, Beltway Blues CIA uh, is kind of our social media handle for the DC chapter, um, or I'm Allison Kasich. And if you're ever in DC area, uh, Ireland's Four Courts is our home pub. It is a, it is a really fun place to go. Um, and uh, well, you know, you don't even, you don't have to wear a blue shirt to come in. We'll be, you know, we'll, we'll be nice to, to everyone. Everyone's welcome. Yeah. Well, no, thanks again, Alison. It really was our pleasure. Maybe if, yeah, we're over there one day, we'll, uh, we'll catch you at that, at that Irish pub if they're willing to let a couple of gunners in. Um, best of luck to you and the blues uh, for the rest of the season, which it pains me less to say now that we've met you. Uh, although maybe not too much luck for uh, this evening's game against Arsenal, but on our side of things, listeners, and viewers, if you enjoyed this show, please do subscribe wherever you like to find your favorite podcasts. Check us out on social media too. We are at United Mates FP on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. UnitedMatesFP.com is the website featuring pretty much everything that we get up to, as well as some great articles, some that Yanni and myself have written. And then if you happen to feel like putting some faces to these voices, find us on YouTube. Just look for United Mates Football Podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button while you're at it. Until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Goodbye.